last night I was doing a little bit more research on this because um, I'm kind of intrigued with motivation. There's a lot of research. There's a lot of information out there. And, um, you know, ultimately I've come to my own personal conclusions. And I would also invite all of you to come to your personal conclusions relating to, to motivation. And we're going to talk it through. So we're going to go step by step because how many of us have learners that start great guns? They come running in. Yes, we're motivated. Yes, we want to learn. And after five, six, seven sessions, they've disappeared. And I think many of us kind of sit there thinking, okay, what did we do? Was it our fault? Most of the time, absolutely not. It's nothing that we're doing. It's they are struggling to keep the consistency, the persistence and the constancy needed to learn a language, which is what all of you know. Um, just want to say quick hello, Fidiel. Good morning. Good to see you. <laughs> and Virginia. Yes. Fantastic. And I think that's Anna hiding there behind the A22. So, what is motivation? Let's start with this question because it's quite an interesting question. You know, when you really go into the ins and outs, I don't think there's a straight, straight, straight answer. As you know, one of my first points uh, to go to is always the dictionary to find out what the dictionaries say about motivation. So here we have it, the willingness to do something or something that causes such willingness. Interesting. So either something that we are willing to do or something that causes us to do something. A little bit of push and pull there. Then we have um, Baumeister and interestingly, he says that the simplest definition is wanting. And looking through the research, actually in 2016, Baumeister did call for a grand theory of motivation. And I think we're still in that place with all the scientists, motivational scientists, looking for this great grand theory of motivation. And then in the year 2000, we have this definition from Kasdin. It explains why people or animals initiate, continue or terminate a certain behavior at a particular time. So that's the start point where we're coming from today. We also could go to the necessity theories, Maslow, Hull with the drive theory. And then after that, we have this conceptualization, connecting motivation with goals. And I think that's where a lot of us connect in because of coaching. So motivation to do something, the goal to achieve and the achievement. Now, I know that when I work with a lot of you, we do actually kind of come into this question of, of motivation. And again, let's just break the word down. We've got to motivate, to be motivated, motivation. But within that word, we've got motive. And can I just check in with all of you? Is that the same in many of your languages? So you have the additional question, motive. Motive actually translates more into reason. Am I right? In your languages? The motive for doing something is more of a synonym with reason for doing something. Now, I don't know if this translates into your language as the same, but in English it is. Motivation and motive are actually quite different. Let's be a little bit sinister. 
when you come into murder situations, the motive for killing somebody, you know, the criminal investigations always talk about the motives. Then it's very different to motivation. Is motivation positive or negative? So I think we, we already, five, 10 minutes into this, we can see that there are many perspectives of this word. And what's going to be very important is that we connect in with what is the perspective of the person that I'm working with. Because all of us may have a different interpretation of the word motivation. Now, let's come back into this because again, it's needs, desires, wants, urges. Is there a difference between wanting something, liking something? Can I want something but not like it? Can I like it but not want it? And are we only looking at the motor to achieve something? Now, let's go a little bit back to our brain and back to our friend dopamine. I know that all of you as neuro language coaches, you know that we have this great uh, connection to the word dopamine. It keeps coming out and it keeps coming out. Now, dopamine is key in this motivation mix. If we just break it down very simply, the dopamine signal passing from one neuron to the next, interacting with the receptors inside that synapsis between the two neurons. Now, it's very important which pathway the dopamine is taking. And it's key for motivation which pathway the dopamine is going. The most important one for reward is what we call the mesolimbic pathway. Mid, middle of the brain goes to various places, for example, cerebral cortex. On the way, it hits nucleus acabans. And there we have this increase in dopamine which is then triggering this kind of reward prediction. And that means the brain is expectant. It's expecting something good to happen, dopamine, more dopamine released. And that's when we get the motivation to do something. Now, a little bit more about this. Dopamine actually acts before the reward. It makes us do something good or not, or avoid something bad. Interestingly, some research on people who are go-getters, as opposed to people who are, they call them slackers. The go-getters have higher dopamine levels in different areas of the brain. The prefrontal cortex, the striatum. The slackers actually have more dopamine in the anterior insula, which is more involved in this risk perception and emotional response rather than reward response. So dopamine is actually key. And it's almost like, could we say it's enticing us to do something? And also the amygdala is key because when we feel that arousal of reward, that's when the amygdala is sending signals to the prefrontal cortex, which is then storing that sort of information. And that then is stored into short-term, long-term. And later, we all know the hippocampus, the memory master, the memory retriever, is reminding us of that. It keeps remembering, okay, that brings reward. That makes us feel good. So in a nutshell, that is what is happening when we are in that sort of motivating 
or motivational state. Now, a whole body of research has come out called motivational science. What makes up human motivation? And I believe actually it, it developed from 2010 onwards. I think that's when it really started to kick in with more and more research. And very much pro the, the processes of motivation, what is it that stimulates us? And we come to the never ending information about intrinsic, extrinsic. This intrinsic drive, what is it that's getting us to do something to, what are we passionate about? What is it that's connecting us in to it from within? And then the extrinsic, the, could we say monetary rewards, external rewards, external factors. Now, obviously the permanence of inner, it's within us. So it's a much stronger drive. But there may be external factors that motivate us. You know, as we go through life, we kind of, unfortunately or fortunately, we live in a society across the world that kind of drives us to want things outside. Could we even say when we're studying and we want a certificate, is that external or is it internal? So again, we've got gray areas where, okay, if I want to buy a car, that's my motivation to earn more money, that's an external factor. But sometimes there is a gray line between that internal, external. And is it really enough, the intrinsic, to stay in a language learning process? Now, this is what we are looking for. We're looking for the questions of how do we keep our learners in that language learning process? How are you all doing so far? Any questions, any comments? Let's just see if there are any questions so far. By the way, I've got the sea rolling in and out behind me. Just to make you all smile and make you all want to come to Sitges sooner. <laughs> I'm going to be organizing some things today still for the conference in, in March. So uh, still enjoying this environment and checking in with the hotel. Right, here we go. This is the big question. How do we get the motivation from our learners? Now, let's really, really talk about this. You know, those who don't know me, first I want to say, forgive me for this picture. Those who do know me, you know that I have this picture on the course. And I always love this picture because it gives that question mark of what is the golden carrot for the learner? What is going to keep the learner there, achieving and achieving and achieving and achieving and moving forwards. You know, learning a language is not just get in a car, learn to drive and drive it. Learning a language, let's go back to our mother tongue. It takes us five years to speak our native language well as a kiddie. Now, obviously we're doing that subconsciously, so we're not even aware that we're learning it. As an adult, we are aware that we could also bring in that subconscious, and we'll talk about that in a little while. Now, let's just talk this through because we've already seen that reasons, motive, motivation cause confusion. And 
we really can understand that every single person may have a totally different perspective of what motivation means. Now, one thing is very, very clear. As a trainer, teacher, educator, I have to stop thinking, I motivate my learners. That, we could change it to, I entertain my learners. I amuse them. I keep them happy. I keep them wanting to come back because we do things that are exciting and they enjoy it and they love it and they love to be there. Again, that's different to them finding and really discerning what's their driving factor in that process. So we really have to separate this out. We have to be very clear from our perspective and help them to become very clear. And if that's the only reason that they come because they enjoy what I do, great. That might be their external motivator, how we do the sessions, the process itself. But it's not me, the educator. I'm amusing, entertaining. I think we need to keep that separately away from the motivation argument. As a coach, and we spoke about coaching yesterday, we, we continuously bring in this coaching conversation. We do need to sit with our learners and find out, you know, what is your perspective on motivation? What is your interpretation of this? How do you, my learner, really separate out the reason, the motive, the motivation? And have this conversation with them. How many times do we get learners saying, oh gosh, yes, I'm 10, I'm really motivated, but I've got no time. That is actually two different things in one. That's motivation and commitment. And again, we need to separate them out and we need to help the learner to separate out. This is a conversation about the motivation. In a minute, we're going to have a conversation about you not having time. And we're going to manage that separately. If you manage it all together in the same conversation, there's gonna be confusion. So we need to separate them out. We need to find their reasons. What are your reasons for being here? Normally, learners think that the reasons are the motivation. So I would suggest that maybe from now on, we're going to change the word motivation to vision, the vision for the learning. Maybe if we do that, we're going to separate out this confusion of reason, motive, motivation. And then, firstly, we're gonna say, okay, well, what are your reasons or what's your motivation to be here? What's your motive? And then we start to ask them vision questions. What's behind this reason? What's going to change in your life once you've got this? Where's it going to take you? What's it going to bring you? What doors is it going to open for you? Now, can I say that, you know, for some kiddies worldwide, Kiddies who come into languages, as a child, the, the doors that it opens for them in the future, it's incredible. You hear stories of, of kiddies from countries like Brazil, Mexico, just having English 
opens a new world for these kids. How can we help them to connect in, to see that new world potentially in the future for them? So vision is key in the learning process. And I think now we're going to focus more on that word, really. And I'm probably going to change this in my course to focus on vision so that we start really separating out this confusion that we all have with motivation, motive, reasons. Reasons for learning have a totally different energy to vision. And totally different to commitment. And by the way, no judgment. Whatever my learner has as a vision, fine. Obviously, as long as it's not harming anybody or doing anything criminal. For example, if my learner is a lawyer and he wants to earn more money to buy a Porsche or a, a Mercedes Benz, okay, fine. If that's the vision that you feel that this language can then give you more business, can then give you more money, and that's really one of the visions coming from this, why not? Because it's driving you with that passion to learn. Do you know, I had one lady, and it was quite a, an interesting conversation. She wanted to improve her English so that she could spend less time writing emails. Because she spent so long writing emails and she was sick and tired of it. So the question was, okay, well, you know, once you've got those emails under wraps and you're not taking so much time, What's that gonna bring you? How's it gonna change your life? And she actually said, I could spend more time on the golf course. And that was it. She was excited, she got the vision, she was gonna spend less time in the office, emails were gonna be very quick and she was gonna be out there on the golf course. And you know, when you have these types of conversations, you see people's energy change. You see the twinkle in their eyes and it's like, whoa, yes. And that's what we want. That's really what we want, that twinkle, that connection to the golden carrot. Once you've got that golden carrot, you've got commitment. They do things by themselves. They stay in the process. If they haven't managed to do it, they'll still come to you every week. So in some ways, you need to find that golden carrot so that they do feel that commitment to the process. I know that many of you already know this, so forgive me if I'm repeating myself. When I was 15, I met my future, future, future husband. And I met him in Spain. And I went... Well, we spoke in French, by the way, when we met. It was the common language. And I went home thinking, hmm, he's never going to learn English. I need to learn Spanish. So I got my father's Teach Yourself Spanish books, and I started to write my first letter to him. At that point in time, I was learning French, Latin, Greek at school. So my first letter, I wish I'd still got it, it, it must have been a historical mix of Latin, French, Spanish, and English. But the beautiful thing is he understood. He understood what I'd written and he wrote back. And for two solid years, between the years of me being 15 to 17, I didn't see him because he went to military service. In those days, people did things like that. And we were writing to each other for two years. Now, in those two years, everybody, I confess, instead of studying for my school exams, 
every single day I was studying Spanish, translating Spanish, writing letters, translating letters, looking at the grammar, looking at texts. I taught myself Spanish. The commitment was there. You know, I look back now, nobody forced me, nobody made me. I learned by myself. The commitment was there. Now, obviously, the motivational factor was love. And I think many of us who do learn different languages, often it is because we've met somebody or we've moved somewhere to learn the language. So that is very much an intrinsic driver. Obviously, we can't ask all of our learners, all of our clients to go and fall in love or to, uh, to connect with people just to connect and learn a language. But it is that question of, OK, what else could there be that's going to get them to be passionate about learning, want to learn and be committed at the same time? More often than not, over the years, I have seen when people have really hit on that energy and they've got the vision, then they're committed. So, when I was kind of thinking about this webinar, I was thinking, okay, well, actually we need to think about this from different age groups, because it's not the same trying to get the vision from kiddies to trying to get the vision from corporates. So let's just take a walk, firstly with the, with the little ones. You know, from the years zero to seven, um, we are subconsciously absorbing information. So we don't really fully have this rational, analytical, logical part of the brain it starts kicking in from the age of seven onwards, prefrontal cortex executive functions start kicking in after the age of seven. So it's kind of like whatever we're doing as a kiddie in those years, it's very much coming from that subconscious drive. We do things because for the pure, sometimes for the pure like of doing it, maybe we want to play a game just because we like playing the game, you know? So we are driven very much from intrinsic as a kid because we don't have this discerning factor of, should I, shouldn't I, do I analyze it, do I rationalize it? No, if we wanna do it, we do it, simple. Life is so simple when we're that age. It complicates as we get older. But if we are with children, you know, as educators, I do think it's still about trying to see if we can help them to brainstorm as a group, you know, well, what is this about? What, what could it bring us? Or what game could you play if you could do this? And connecting it to their little world around them. Maybe they've got animals that they could talk to in a different language, as a mystery language. You know, everything is about games, fun, and magical, could we say? So many, many times when I've spoken to, to little kids, um, they often, especially it works really well when they think that that language is a code that nobody understands. And I've had parents that have done that where they've got this sort of magical language with daddy and with mummy, it's another language, another magical language. And you know, you are able to really help small children to subconsciously come into languages. The best years for learning languages are between two and four. I know many parents with trilingual, quadrilingual children. And you could try to see if, by the way, I think I've actually got the wrong slide. Let me just check. 
No, I haven't. I was just checking. Um, you could try to see if they can connect into some understanding of who are they talking with when they talk that language. Maybe mummy in Spanish, daddy in English, um, la guarderia in Catalan. That's what I was uh, yesterday speaking with somebody. They had a trilingual kitty, Catalan, Castellano, English. And also you helping the, the little one to sort of decipher when to use which, because remember in those early years, there's going to be a time when all of those languages are going to be coming out. So helping children to connect in, now it's this one, now it's this one, this is what we're using it for, and really trying to stimulate them to understand connection. And also engaging emotions, when you're goal setting with smaller children, there's going to be much more teacher input. Because children cannot decide and rationalize what's better, what's not. You could try to give some choices and see what they like and connect with on the emotional level, but they are not able to set goals. So there's going to be much more coming in from the teacher However, you could ask them what activities they like, they enjoy. Many children know what they like and what they don't like. The problem is we never really ask them enough in a learning process. And if you've got a big group of children finding out, maybe you've got different groups that like different things. Maybe in one class, you can get the different groups doing different things to get to the same outcome. By the way, that would be very much following the multiple intelligences by Gardner. And connecting them with real life. And with emotions. Now, small children often can't express how they feel. So maybe you can ask them how they feel in colors, in animals. What animal are you feeling like today? Or maybe in situations, or maybe in faces, you know, you give them a picture of smiley, laughing, blushing, and they choose the face that they want to express. I'm sure many of you have seen that, um, I think it's on YouTube, the video of the teacher who gives the children the choice of how they want to come into the classroom. I think it's either a high five, a kiss or a hug or a nothing. That sort of thing for, for little kiddies is choice for them to express themselves. And I think it's very much the same when we're trying to find that sort of connection with passion, of liking. At that age, it's all about liking. Now, when we get to the teenage stage, everything is about disliking everything. We go to the other extreme when we're teenagers. So how do we get the passion for teenagers? Well, again, I think it's about asking them again, how do they want to learn? What do they want to work on? Really finding out what do they not like? Above all, what do I need to avoid with teenagers? And if you've got a group of them, find out, you know, what are the biggest dislikes here? Remember that teenagers are very driven by the amygdala, by the emotional brain. So it's going to also be about recognizing their emotions. If they don't want to be there, recognize it. I'm really sorry that you don't want to be here today. Recognize unfairness. I'm really sorry that you're feeling forced to be here. And then again, it's about really trying to see what could 
this language bring you in your real life, in your personal situation? What is relevant to you? What's going to get you connecting in to the language? And you might have a group brainstorm on the relevance. If you've got a big group, you might actually give them some key questions and ask them to go away and think about it. And those key questions might be, 10 years from now, imagine that you can really speak fluent English. Where are you gonna be in your life? What are you gonna do with that language? Where's it gonna take you? What could you use it for? How's it gonna change your future? And getting them to go away and think about it, then when they come back in, you can open up that group discussion. And maybe you could really get them to compare, even in groups, you know, discussing. You could even ask them this question of, okay, well, how could you create more dopamine around this learning? When could you practice it with your hobbies and your pastimes? You know, we have a world of technology today where kiddies are very much addicted. By the way, that's another trait of the teenage brain, the being prone to addictions. So it, it could be that, okay, well, if you are playing video games, how about playing them in English? How about getting that benefit from being in that game and absorbing the language? How about putting your phone in English? How about only watching movies, series in original version? And seeing if they would be stimulated to bring in the language with what they enjoy doing. By the way, and this is just a, a question that's just arisen in my mind. You know, we talk about dopamine. If you think that they're, they're, they're doing something that they enjoy, they're going to have those happy chemicals produced anyway. So if we can get them connecting, playing a game with the language, who's to say that that won't increase their sort of levels of enjoyment when they are speaking the language through life? That's a thought that's just come to me now. So if you can find that magical key to the door to get a teenager into not only what they enjoy a video game but with the language that they're learning could be an interesting test to see how years later they respond to that language so we've looked at the kiddies we've looked at the teenagers by the way the way that we speak with teenagers has to be on that equal status has to be from that coaching level of respect. How do you want to work? What can we do together? How can I help you? And that will keep that emotional brain calm. And especially that we are not being directive with them. As soon as we go directive with teenagers, they're going to come into that defensive response of not wanting to do it. Now let's get to our corporate clients, <clears throat> business clients, corporate clients. Let's say the more mature learners. We've got a lot of frustrated business clients. We've got a lot of busy brains. We've got people who are overworked, underpaid, a lot of stress. And in many, many, many cases, they need the target language. In many cases, the company is forcing them to learn the target language. So you've got learners that even walking through the door is stressful for them. 
because they know that they're going to have an hour with you when they could be working through their workload. So the frame of mind often is not the right frame of, frame of mind even before they started. And, you know, I know, and I'm confessing, and I'm curious if any of you will confess, sometimes in the past I've felt a little bit offended when you've got a client that actually you're sensing they don't want to be there, you're sensing that they're too busy, they never do their work at home, they always say, yes, 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 I'll do it, and they never do. And I remember about 20 years ago when I was really coming into corporates, probably for the first time and moving away from private sessions and, and coming into businesses. I remember sometimes feeling a little bit hurt, a little bit offended. What we need to do now is really, really understand the perspective of the other person. We need to sit in their shoes because it's not about us. This process is about them. And it's really about recognizing their pain, recognizing that they are in that situation. And we have to recognize and address the unfairness. Find out, you know, what are your reasons for being here? My boss has sent me. Okay, so I'm sensing that you really don't want to be here and I'm sorry to hear that. I'm sorry that in some ways it, it sounds like you're being forced to do this again. You have to recognize the unfairness and the situation. And then I think of, again, it's about troubleshooting, well, what are your issues for this learning process? Is it overload of work? So busy brain? Is it time issues, time management? Or is it commitment problems? So again, it's about pinpointing what is the pain point for my learner in this process? Having that conversation with them to find out. Now, as I said, we're addressing the unfairness. You must do this. Just want to go through a couple of things relating to, to unfairness. How many of you have clients where, you know, they really don't want to be there? Florina, a little bit, yes. Yeah, a fair deal as well, yeah. How many of you have clients where the company has changed the lingua franca to English? Feriel, yeah, that's a big pain point for the nationals. Now, I was working in a German company where they did that. And the employees, the management were, I'm going to say, indignant. Because, you know, firstly, they're being told, I'm sorry, you can't speak your native language. Where on earth is anybody told, I'm sorry? You can't speak your native language here. Yeah. Or your native language comes second here. So there is a lot of pain in that. And I do think if any of you are working with this type of company, I think it's about asking human resources to sit down with you to create a language strategy. Now, those of you who have done the professional neuro language coaching course with me, you know that we talk about language strategy. And it really means how do you get the whole company to avoid feeling that pain, but achieve that they buy into speaking that target language? How do you normalize the languages in that company? And that's the big question. And it's about sitting down with human resources and creating that language strategy for that company. Now, Professor Seidel Neely, 
Harvard professor. Can I say she must have the most strangest name I've ever, ever heard on earth. Beautiful name, Seidel, but very strange. Um, this lady has been studying, observing what happens to a company when lingua franca is imposed as English. She was working with a Japanese company studying and observing. That's where she did the study. Um, she's actually written a book about this. Originally, she was working with David Rock's scarf model, for those of you who know what I mean. And then she changed it and focused more on um, emotional blocks in that company. Now, over those two years, the CEO made an announcement and told the company that in two years, they would be totally transferring all of their business into English. In two years time, that would be the lingua franca of the company. So the CEO actually did give them a two year warning to adjust, improve, come into English. Now the observations over those two years were quite interesting because if any of you know the scarf model, there was scarf bingo. All of the emotional triggers came out and more. Firstly, you had the feeling of unfairness. It's unfair that we cannot use our native language, that we have to go into English. Emotional trigger that affects the learning process as well. Secondly, they became very competitive with each other. Some of the lower level employees who could speak perfect English were then laughing at the ones in the higher management who couldn't speak English. So you had competitiveness, you had people scrambling to get the jobs of the others. You know, it became an internal competition. You also had obviously status problems, people feeling superior because they could speak the language, people feeling inferior because they couldn't speak the language. And obviously you had uncertainty kicking in because people were fearing losing their jobs. There was a fear and uncertainty of future. Autonomy was absolutely taken away from them. They had no choice. They had to do this. Can you imagine being the language instructor going into that company? Wow, you've got an emotional volcano happening in there. And I'm curious to know how well people were learning in that environment. And I would suggest to any company worldwide that wants to do that, they need to call in a team of neuro language coaches. Definitely. Because we need to be able to navigate, surf those emotions of the learners to get them to learn. We need to be able to understand their fights, flights, freezers, emotional blocks all the time. Absolutely. So if you see any companies changing their lingua franca, I would connect with them and really ask to have a meeting with their human resources or management and sit down and create that language strategy with them. Let's get back to firstly addressing the unfairness. Whenever you hear, even teenagers, my parents have sent me, or people who have to take an exam, I have to take an exam in this. People who need residency and they have to take the exam for residency. I don't want to do this. I'm never going to use the language. First step, I'm really sorry that you have to do this. And I'm sorry that you have that feeling of not wanting to do it. Second step, Find out, you know, well, what are the reasons that you have to do this? And then the third step, what could it bring you? 
just imagine you've got this, you've got the exam, you've got the residency, how's that gonna change your life? And take them beyond the pain so that they connect in with vision. And discovering that passion, you know, it really is about asking the right questions. You could find out where are they? You could get them to give you a number on a scale, maybe. Or you could bring in that sort of not or highly. And remember that you have to discern if they really use the word motivation in the sense of passion, drive, vision, or reasons. Remember, you're going to have learners coming in saying, yes, I'm a 10. I'm really highly motivated. And then when you say, okay, well, what's the reason for the motivation? I need it for work, for meetings, for business. Is that really, really, really passion, drive, vision? Or is it a need? And here we come back to needs. I need it for work would be the more appropriate response from them. Is it a faked motivation covering up a need? And by the way, that need might be actually financial security. I need the job because the job is paying for my mortgage, my car, my family, my food, and I need English to survive in this job. So again, you really need to check with the client. What does this mean for you? Once you've got the reasons I need it for work, then you're going to be pushing for the vision, the passion, the drive. And even trying to get the emotions behind that. Now, many of our learners, business learners, do not have time. They are, in fact, struggling. So something that we can do is try to see what can help them in the learning process. What could they do as quick wins along the way? You know, motivation can be also from me sensing that I'm actually achieving something. And this is where coaching is key because you're setting small goals to get them to feel the quick wins along the way. And find out, you know, what can I do to help you in this process? How can I help you to normalize the language? When can you bring in the target language in your past times? What can be the specific goals? How can we do it that's going to be fun for you? How can we get you curious? Remember, curiosity is dopamine, synonym for dopamine. How can you have fun with it? And most importantly, how can we move you into positive feelings? and move you away from feeling guilty and feeling negative. You know, many of our learners do feel guilty. And if they get that guilty feeling, they're gonna to start to want to avoid coming to you. The, the real, real question for us is how do we keep them into the positive state? Now, I come into my full-blown confession of the morning. I'm learning another language at the moment and I have a language coach with me, one of uh, the neuro language coaches. I have to say she has the patience of an angel because every single week I say to her, yes, 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 I want to go and do something and I'm going to do things by myself. And every single week I come in and say, ah, I didn't have time. I didn't have time. And believe me, everybody, I haven't had time. So it, it, yes, I could squeeze 10 minutes here. I could squeeze 10 minutes there. What I have been doing and squeezing in 
is when I finish work at half past 11 or midnight, I sit down with YouTube and maybe for half an hour, I listen to series in that language. That's what I've been doing to compensate me not sitting, writing, studying explicitly. So I have been trying to get implicit input as much as I can. To the extent that some weeks ago, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was actually dreaming in that language. I can't speak it, but I was dreaming in that language. It was so bizarre. And I woke up thinking, wow, my subconscious brain is really good. I wish it would come into the conscious brain. But it demonstrated to me that something's happening. Something's happening. And if I just keep on with that consistent, maybe half an hour, three times a week, that's my downtime, half past 11 to midnight, sometimes midnight to half past 12, I just sit and absorb. And my language coach, very patient, lots of positivity. And every single week she tries. So what are you gonna do when, you know, during the week? And I'm sure sooner or later I will get there. But the most important thing for me is that I'm not made to feel guilty. And this is something that, you know, often without realizing it, that's the vibe that we're giving our learners. Oh, you didn't do your work again. Oh, okay. Oh, I'm hearing that you're too busy. Okay. Hmm. What we need is to really sit in their shoes. If you've got a busy executive, believe me, they do not have time. And by us trying to force them or demanding or giving that vibe of, hmm, it's not helping them. What we need to do is recognize, you know, I'm really sorry that you've been so busy. I understand. I know you're a busy person. How can I help? What can we do to troubleshoot this? Because I know that you want to learn the language. I know your motivations are 10. How can we troubleshoot this situation together? And really finding out as well, you know, if you are in this process with me, and I know that you're motivated, I know that you need the language, but I also know you've got a vision. And I know that you're committed because you are with me every single week. You do keep coming back. Thank you for that. So may we have a, a mini coaching conversation about maybe time management, if you're open to that. Or maybe we're going to have a, a little conversation about subconscious input, like me with my half an hour downtime absorbing that language. You know, some, sometimes we, we have had coaching conversations and our clients have come up with the brilliant idea, one client especially, 10 minutes every morning with my breakfast, I've got my English things next to my breakfast table, I have my coffee, I sit down with my coffee and my croissant and I do 10 minutes every morning, 10, 15 minutes. That's how I wake up, relaxed, enjoying a little bit of uh, connection to the language. 10 minutes every day is 70 minutes a week. That's one hour, 10 minutes. 15 minutes every day is, I'm struggling to calculate 15 times seven <laughs> on a Saturday morning. Let's work it out. So that would be one hour, one and a half, one and three quarters. An hour and three quarters every week is a long time broken down into 15 minutes every day. By the way, I need to do this with my uh, exercise regime as well. I need to start breaking that down so that I do it more often. It's like anything in life, you know, if we want to do something, the secrets are breaking it down and shorter periods of time. And how can we reward ourselves for those 15 minutes? 
how can we build in like a little bit of a reward so that we're creating the dopamine for that situation? So every day I want to get up, do that, because maybe after doing that, then I'll have my coffee. That's going to be my reward. Or I'm going to sit and do it with my coffee, but once I've done that, then I'll have my croissant. And that could also work with children, with teenagers. Building in those rewards could also help. I was reading one particular research which talked about bribes for kiddies. We don't want to be bribing. What we want is that they are in building their own motivation, commitment, resilience, consistency, persistence, constancy, all the way. So commitment conversations are totally different to motivation conversations, especially with busy executives. Now, we also have to maybe touch upon this conversation of brain hacks. I'm going to call them brain hacks because it really is that, that conversation with the learner of, okay, I'm hearing you're too busy. I'm hearing you. You really are overworked and you've got so much on your plate so how can we get you to learn this language because you you're telling me you need it so we might try and use some tricks for the brain there might be the survival question really telling the brain you need this to survive in this job there might be also the usefulness of having it, the emotional impact having it, and even, even, even getting them into curiosity. And by the way, at one of the conferences I was at in uh, November, I uh, showed this slide on tricking the brain. And you can see there on the slide, I've actually put bizarre curiosity. And somebody in the audience actually asked me, what do you mean with bizarre curiosity? And I literally reflected it back and said, that's exactly what you've just done. You, you've just asked me, you've just got curious about it. That's what I mean. Something that's different, that piques that interest to say, hey, what is that? and constantly trying to provoke that curiosity. Curiosity is dopamine. You know, in those early years of life, we are naturally curious. As we age, we become less curious. We become more fearful more cautious. In many ways, as we get older, it's about how do we come back to being kiddies again? How do we come back to get that curiosity in our lives and to want to ask questions and find out, discover? And on the other side, I'm going to ask my learner, how can we get you into quick wins? Because if you feel quick wins, you're going to want more. And if you really are noticing your progress, you're going to want more. So again, it's about how to provoke them, provoking with cognates, maybe provoking them to make funny noises, you know, I'm sure that all of you have seen that YouTube video of the multiple lingual translator, the multilinguist. It's the comedy sketch where she is sitting there and instead of speaking the languages, she's just making the noises of the language. It's hilarious. Go onto YouTube, have a look at it if you haven't, if you haven't uh, seen it before. But something like that to get them into the fun of maybe sounds that they can't normally make. By the way, years ago when I was trying to come into a little bit of Arabic, I have great problems and still, I will get back to my Arabic one day, 
um, with the ang sound in words. I think there's a, there's a sound that's coming from the back of the throat. I have terrible problems with that. And I remember my coach saying to me, you have to sound like blah, blah from the symptoms. The problem was I've never seen the symptoms in my life, so I had no idea what he was saying. But he, he, he was trying to get me to go around making that um, sound. I still can't do it, but that was sort of the philosophy, you know, in your everyday life, go and make that sound. Have fun with it. Scaffolding. Scaffolding, scaffolding, scaffolding. How can I get my brain to connect and associate and connect and associate all the time when I'm learning a language? What's going to trigger those connections? You know, when we really come into that neuro language coaching philosophy, we need to be thinking, okay, I want them to learn this, but maybe we could trigger it with something else so that they're firing the same neurons with two things. And that way they're learning by connecting more. So that's also something that we are provoking all the time. Previous knowledge connections, new knowledge connections, associating and bite-sized goals. And sitting down, do the goal review. Have you achieved this? Yes, no. Yes, brilliant. Well done. Let's go to the next. And really give them the message. Don't study. You don't need to study. Obviously, if you study, you're going to go faster. But if you're so busy, let's try to talk about subconscious input. What can you do in your busy life to increase the subconscious input of that language? I asked a, a very busy executive, Italian executive, years ago this question. And through this conversation, we really separated out because this, this particular person had the philosophy that learning was sitting down and battling with it. No, that helps, but it's not everything with language learning. This is how we learned a language as a kitty. It just came in. I have the proof living in Catalonia just by watching Catalan TV. That language is in my brain just from watching the TV. I can speak it to a certain degree, but I can fully, fully, fully understand that language. And that was only subconscious input. I've never had a lesson in my life. When I was working in Italy, again, subconscious input coming in, me living there, working there, being with Italians, I was able to convert the Spanish, the French, the Catalan into Italian. Again, subconscious input, no lessons in my life. So we have to bring this message to our learners because they think that learning a language is going to the academy, sitting there once a week, battling with the language and going home. Now, yes, studying the language helps. It turbo boosts the subconscious input. So this Italian executive actually changed the phone to be in English, changed the computer to be in English. All the settings were in English. Um, she actually had to buy a television because she didn't have one, so she could watch documentaries, movies, series, whatever, in English. She only read the news in English on the internet. She only read, she started to read everything in English. Books, newspapers, whatever, only in English. When she was driving to work, she would put the car radio in English. After three months, she noticed the impact. 
she herself said to me that she was using words that she'd never ever in her life said before. And even words that she didn't even know where she'd got them from. One particular example, she was in a meeting and she said the word beneath. And she was shocked because normally she would always say under and suddenly this poetic word came out beneath. And that's when she really knew it was working. Subconscious input, sooner or later, has an effect. So have this conversation with the learner. Help your learner not to feel guilty about not studying. Congratulate them for being with you every week, even though they're so busy. And then stimulate them to think about how can I expose, bombard the brain more to this target language. And just some tips and tricks to help people to learn. The more real, the more personal, the more we can make it relevant, the more we can textualize it, get them to do all of that. Apparently, research demonstrates that drumming helps to learn the language. You know, rhythmically. And can I say, you know, when I was learning Latin, I don't know about all of you. Have any of you done Latin at school? Did you do that? Amo, ama, samat? <laughs> you know, the, the patterns. And I remember as a child going into that rhythmic way of repeating those verbs and even with my Spanish when I was learning Spanish by myself I remember going into those verbs by myself with the rhythm you know puedo puedes puede podemos podéis pueden rhythmically helps the brain to recognize repeat recall Apparently as well, talking to ourselves has an impact. I didn't realize this, but apparently we like the sound of our own voices. I'm not sure about that, everybody, because whenever I see uh, something that I've done, like a webinar, I don't want to see it. I don't want to, I just do it and get out of it. I'm sure many of you know what I mean. But apparently talking to self really does trick the brain to focus on words. So get your learners to talk to themselves in that language. Apparently, we have a longer attention span as well. We listen to ourselves much more than anybody else. <laughs> That's interesting, huh? <laughs> chanting as well. Well, we could say that chanting again is that rhythmic sort of melodic chant again it's imprinting in the brain and exercising while learning more and more research showing that when we are using motor um literally exercising the connection brain brain body movement brain is helping to embed learning, facilitating learning. So if any of you go running, if any of you like dancing, you could be dancing with one ear on language. I know I have actually been running with uh, some audios in different languages. So again, it's questions for your learners. What can you do when you're exercising? If you're in the gym, what can you just listen to or just have it on the background? You don't have to focus on it. Just get the subconscious listening to it. Separate out conscious, subconscious. So can I say my greatest conclusion from all of this discussion about motivation is we need to sit and talk to the learners about it. 
it's no good as having this perspective and understanding of what we think motivation is or not. We have to sit with them and discover or help them to discover what's going to be their vision, passion, drive to learn this language, not only to learn it, but to be consistently learning it, to keep them in that process. So we're going to sit with the learner or group of learners. We're going to be asking the right questions. What are the reasons? Let's separate reasons from vision and separating those from commitment. Each of those is going to be a conversation. So the answers will come from your learner. Look, there's a typo there. At midnight last night, it wasn't there. My apologies for the typo. It's not form, it's from. And just to move into concluding now, and, and in a minute we'll open the microphones and get you all uh, connecting with me about your perspectives of motivation and what you think. Your language coaching, this is what we're bringing in. We're bringing in from the coaching and we're bringing in from the neuro. And we marry these together with the language expertise that you all possess. And obviously, you know, the more that we can connect in with understanding the brain, with motivation, reasons, etc., and dopamine, and marry that with coaching conversations, the more you're going to get the right answers from the learner. So neuro language coaching is a community of amazing like-minded people worldwide, striving to help all learners come into languages more effectively, more efficiently, faster. We are constantly connecting in, doing the free webinars. I will be doing some more over the next weeks. We've just done a series of three in one week and grateful to all of you for being here, for connecting in. And if any of you are interested, do connect in with our neuro language coaches who are here. There's many of them here who have been through this experience and are in the shoes of with the learner sitting with the learners and going through all of this with the learners. Got some courses coming up. And by the way, just to share, and I didn't share this last night, um, we try to give as much facilities as we can. When I did my coaching training 15 years ago, it cost me nearly 10,000 pounds and I had to take out debts, loans to become a coach and to get my life coaching ICF accredited training. It took me a long time and a lot of money. And coaching courses I, I know are very expensive worldwide. And this is the reason that I try to bring them to the teaching world at a more reasonable price. And you can always use these credits to then become a life coach if you wanted to. Quite a few of our new language coaches have also become life coaches and are developing that pathway through life. So do connect in if you're interested and you want to see those discounts that we're always bringing in 